This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So this is a call to order. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of August, oh, excuse me, September 2nd, uh, 2020, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law of uh, Mass General Laws uh, 30A, uh, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsayek, and I will be the acting chair for this planning board meeting. I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.30 uh, p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will take a roll call. Board members, when you hear your name uh, called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. Uh, Maria Chow. Present. And Doug Marshall? Present. Janet McGowan? Here. Andrew McDougall? Present. It, did I pronounce that correct, Andrew? You got it perfectly. Nice job. All right, good, good. And Tom Long? Present. And, uh, and then uh, Johanna Newman is not, not present, correct? I think she's not here. Okay, all right, that's fine. Um, board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily, temporarily <clears throat> to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, let Sean or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes uh, will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use a raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. And then we have the information shown on this slide. I'm not gonna read it, but there's a link uh, provided to the Zoom uh, site. And we'll just leave that on for you know, a few seconds. And uh, that's for people to shift over. If you're on the TV, you can, uh, you can either call in or use that link and you're able to uh, comment. As, as, as part of the public. So just leaving that up there. Um, and then I'm just gonna leave that up there for a little bit longer. Make sure everybody sees it. Okay, now I'm gonna, I gotta find the agenda here. Yeah. So at this point, we'd like to open uh, with the minutes. Uh, we do have some minutes, but they're in draft form and we need to uh, review them. They were for August, August 5th, was it? That's right. Chris, okay. So um, let's, let's take a, we just got those today. We just, they're lengthy and we wanna look at that. Now we, okay. Uh, but you're also looking to get a decision written up, Chris, based on those minutes. I am, and um, I also have to finish the minutes for July 1st. So I will send you the, um, the minutes as soon as they're done. If you have big problems with the minutes, you can write back to me. And if it looks like there are big problems, we'll just hold off on, um, on reviewing them and um, we'll review them on the 16th of September. In, in, in any event, we'll review them on the 16th of September but I may go ahead and start to put together the decision for Amherst Media because they're very eager to get that decision. So- um, That's what I was thinking. So, but we need the minutes finalized before you can do the decision. 
Yeah, and you also need July 1st minutes. So you can take these August 5th minutes and look at them at your leisure. And then if you have any significant problems with them, um, write to me via email. Don't write to the rest of the planning board, but just write to me. And I'll try to incorporate whatever um, difficulties you have into the, um, or correct the difficulties and incorporate that into the decision. You may get it all at the same time around the 16th of September. Okay. And uh, now we're going to open up this uh, to the public for comments, uh, general comments, uh, not comments on anything that is within the agenda. Uh, and Pam, I'm wondering what. Uh, I'm seeing no raised hands, Jack, okay. from the public at this time. Okay, so we can move in. So we have uh, our first public hearing uh, on Amherst Survival Center. And give me one minute. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna, uh, this starts at 635 and 637, we're good. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held <clears throat> for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021-01 Amherst Survival Center, 138 Sunderland Road. Request site plan review to erect a temporary shelter shed quote, unquote, in the parking lot of Amber Survival Center to replace the tent that is there um, to provide a more weather resistant shelter and to allow for continued emergency food provision through COVID-19 crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, this is in a commercial zoning district. Uh, it's MAP 5A parcel 26. So are there any board member disclosures? Okay, so we can ask the applicant to present the, the project. Chris, can you yep. remind me who is coming to represent this application? Is it Jan Idelson? Jan Idelson, Kara Schnell, and Carlene Bassler. Are okay, all they are all here. I'm gonna move them all over. Promote to panelists. <clears throat> okay. So they are all promoted to panelists. So whenever Jack is ready, he can invite them to give their presentation. Oh. I yeah, uh, so uh, we met with, was it, was it Cara? Okay, yes. hi Cara, how are you? So, uh, Good evening. Yeah, M M Maria, uh, Chris Brestrup, and myself met with you, when was it, yesterday? Yesterday. <laughs> After I got a speeding ticket, no, I didn't get a speeding ticket, but um, uh, <laughs> would you like to present the project, please? Thank you, good evening. My name is Kara Schnell. I'm the Finance and Human Resources Manager at the Amherst Survival Center. Um, as you've already mentioned, I'm joined on this call by my colleague, Carlene Basler, and a board member, Jan Idelson. Thank you, Chris, uh, Maria, and Jack for visiting the center yesterday. I trust that you had an opportunity to see the center in its full current operations. The Amherst Survival Center requests your approval to install a temporary structure or shed on our parking lot to facilitate continued emergency food provisions throughout the winter months. Beginning in March, the center dramatically shifted operations to ensure successful and safe emergency food provision during the COVID-19 health crisis. Many of our community programs were suspended and we shifted our focus solely to our food and nutrition programs. When the economy declines, we see a sharp increase in the need for our services. Currently, 
The inside of the center has been converted to support our increased food pantry operations. The pantry has roughly doubled the amount of food that it's distributing to local residents. We currently see roughly 25 to 35 households on site each day for the pantry. And we have implemented a new contactless delivery service, which is now serving approximately 700 households each month. Fresh food recovery and distribution, as well as our lunch service, are now being provided in the tent that is outside in our parking lot. Our lunch service has increased by 225 to 250%. In prior to March, we would typically see 100 uh, participants each day in our dining hall for lunch. We're now serving approximately 225 to 250 to-go lunches each day. Our current operational layout is working really well. We've been able to accomplish a significant increased output with fewer volunteers inside, social distancing throughout all stages of our operations, mass compliance, physical environmental modifications, as well as um, extensive sanitizing. It's clear that the health crisis will not be resolved before winter. Therefore, we seek to replace the current tent with a more weather resistant temporary structure that will allow for continued operation in our current mode throughout the winter months. You received information on the proposed 14 foot by 30 foot structure. If approved, this structure would be located in the rear of our parking lot, set back significantly from the road. Visually, the shed exterior would mimic the exterior of our existing building for a cohesive appearance. The shed will be used four days a week from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. From 8.30 until noon, our volunteers are sorting through and packaging recovered bread and produce. From noon to three, we're open to the public for services. During that time, we're distributing that recovered food as well as our lunches from the tent. And then from 3 to 3.30, we clean up and we um, secure the location until the next morning. Fish, um, only staff and volunteers would be entering the shed. And similar to the tent, participants will remain outside the tent in a socially distanced line to access food through the garage door openings of the proposed structure. The size of the structure allows for social distancing during setup and distribution, and the multiple garage doors will allow for maximum ventilation. As noted in the plan, the structure will occupy the same um, space in the parking lot as the current tent. Our parking congestion is significantly reduced in our COVID operations. Um, folks, once folks arrive, um, it takes about 15 to 30 minutes for them to receive uh, their items and then they're on their way. So there's significant turnover. Similarly, staff and volunteers continue to park offsite at locations that are generously being offered by our neighbors. To summarize, the center continues to focus on the safe continuity of our food and nutrition programs. Limiting the number of people inside our building is a key component to the safety of our operations. We work hard to ensure that the center will not have to close due to COVID-19 exposure. We recognize if that were ever to happen, the 200 participants that we see each day would have nowhere else to access the food that they need and that we are able to provide. On behalf of the 7,000 people we expect to serve this year, thank you for your consideration of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. You're welcome. Um, the site visit report, Maria, do you, did you draw the short straw on that or? 
Uh, yeah, I can do that <laughs> since you're chairing. Uh, let's okay, see. Thank you. Yeah, after uh, Jack dodged his speeding ticket from uh, <laughs> UMass Police, um, we saw where the current tent was located and it was very well marked and there were people using it when we were there and it looked very well organized and um, supervised and it was clear, you know, it was definitely uh, being used and needed in the community. And then um, Tara took us inside and it was clear that in order to socially distance, they had to use all of the space that they currently have for setup. And so there's just no space for, um, well, there's also, you don't want other people coming in to just, you know, for um, safety, but it's just clear that they're like bursting at the seams as far as trying to keep everyone, you know, safe and employees and staff working there. So, um, so it makes total sense to have a more sturdy structure where they have a tent. Um, and um, I think we also saw, let's see, we just kind of turned around and saw where they had the food storage behind us and the dining hall was converted into a food setup area. So it was just, you know, everything was repurposed because they had to have the six foot clearance. Um, but yeah, the exterior, you know, there's plenty of parking still available and um, people were pretty safely divided from um, oncoming traffic and um, not that there are a lot of cars going through and um, in fact, I think we were the only cars moving, you know, the, the sort of planning board members um, when we were there. So it, it looks like it's um, working out pretty well despite the situation we're in. And um, um, yeah, I don't think we were shown anything. So we had to quickly rush off to our next site visit. So um, I think that's all we saw. We just sort of stood in the entry area of the uh, existing building. Yeah, I, I concur with that. Um, are there any, um, you know, questions from the board? Andrew? I was looking, do we have a raise hand button or we just sort of wave? There, yeah, so there's a participants oh, got thing it. at the got bottom it. that any, any, you click on that, then you can kind of see and then there's some Perfect. dots on the right, lower right, and then that's where you can do a raise hand. Okay, but, cool. Um, uh, well, Cara, just thank you for the service you guys provide to the town. Uh, it's 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 really quite spectacular. I had just a couple of very easy, probably questions for you. It's just the the so the storage unit. It's going to be used for distribution of food. So it's just like issuing the to go lunches, or is any any food preparation that occurs within there. No food preparation occurs with inside the tent or the proposed structure. We are still utilizing our commercial kitchen for the lunch preparation. And there's typically two to three staff and volunteer members in our kitchen daily um, working on that task. That's all the number of people we can fit in that space um, safely. <coughs> So lunches are being prepared within the commercial kitchen and then we use, they are prepared and packaged in the kitchen. And then we utilize various carts to wheel them from the kitchen outside to the tent where they are there, where they are then distributed. And that process happens routinely over the three hour window in which we're open. Got it, okay. And then another quick question as well, as you know, we'll obviously be getting into colder weather. What is the plan to climate control the, the shed? We don't anticipate that we will be putting in any type of heating or electricity inside the shed. It is truly a temporary structure. Um, if we need anything like that, we can run um, extension cords from our building, but we don't foresee a real need to go to that level uh, with this proposed structure. Okay. And then one, one last real quick one, is just the position near the back of the parking lot. I couldn't tell from the site plan. Is it? Is there like a grade change there? Does that? Will those back doors sort of open to a slope? If 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 I'm if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. So, when you reach the rear of our parking lot, it does slope down to a little bit of a, a wetlands kind of a, a water retention berm, if I'm using the appropriate terminology. Um, so it does slope off down there. Um, we don't anticipate actually bringing anything in and out of those three rear bays. 
they would simply be used for ventilation. The primary sites of access to the structure would be the two doors on either end and the three garage door bays on the front. So the rear bays would really be for increased ventilation. Excellent. Thank you. That's all my questions, Jack. Okay. Um, Cara, is it, uh, are the rear bays there just because that's kind of like off, like standard production of this particular shed or is it? No, I think that was oh. our request to oh, okay. just ensure that we had um, extensive ventilation within that space um, due to COVID-19. Um, we just okay. felt that it provided additional safety measures, if you will. Great. Okay. Uh, Doug, please. Yeah, the, uh, the rendering that you provided of the shed uh, looks like it's built on maybe a two by four floor. Um, you know, there's sort of a brown pine colored band around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I just wanted to make sure that you'll work with Rob Mora, the building inspector, to make sure that you have met the applicable accessibility requirements for the space. If you need a little ramp to get in the, the door for people, volunteers who are disabled, uh, you know, you might need that. But I'm not gonna tell you what you need, but you probably should talk with Rob about that. Thank you. Um, I see no other hands. So no further questions from the board and we can accept some public comments at this time, if there are any. And I see none. none. Oh, Jen. First of all, Carlene, did you want to add anything? No, I think that sums it up very nicely. Thanks. Well, hi there. Um, I'm Jen Idelson, and I'm a board member of the Survival Center. And I'm here to tell you that we need your assistance and not even financial. We just need some, we need a decision quickly. Um, we work hard, we volunteer hard, and we create less hardship. Mm. Y'all know our mission, and we're here for everyone, for your neighbors, for your colleagues, mm -hmm. for you. Now during COVID, it's clearer than ever that we're all together in this, but in inequitable, have inequitable resources. The ASC, its staff and volunteers work tirelessly in a tent, in a parking lot, during the unbearable heat and the violent storms this summer. Clearly a more fortified structure is needed. Aside from making this shed Aside from the shed making our mission more effective and on a practical level, it's also symbolic. It tells our neighbors that we're here to stay. It tells our volunteers that we value the time they donate in our parking lot. As life gets tougher, we remain a constant force during these troubling times. Seven years ago, our new building brought us out of a cramped basement. It was intentional that our new home would have space so people could stand up straight. This shed will intentionally show our community that we are here for the long run and we are here for however long it takes. You can rely on us to keep food in your home or in your tent and in your bellies. We will not let anyone down. I'm sure the entire community will support the addition of a shed on the ASC parking lot. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Doug, you have your hand up still. Is that an artifact? That's because I had another question. Oh, good. Well, absolutely, Doug, you, you're the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to know uh, if there's some, uh, how long you would have this shed up? What's the 
what are the conditions at which point you would remove it? And should we be thinking about some sort of formal conditions in our approval that ensure that you do remove it at a, at a certain time? Right now, it's hard to say how long we'll need that shed. Um, ideally, we would like to use it as long as it's needed, as long as we need a safe um, space to continue our food and nutrition operations. Um, it's hard to know how long that will be, but would we'd it, like to be able to use that shed as long as possible. Would it, would it be uh, reasonable to say that when the pandemic is over and you're able, or the, governor, the governor's orders allow you to operate as you did before the pandemic, that it would be removed within, say, three months of that, uh, those conditions being met? We would certainly like to return to our previous operations. We are first and foremost a community center, and that is one piece that's really missing in the midst of this crisis. So um, as soon as we are able to be a community center once again, and we can invite all of those folks back into our building safely, at that point, we likely would no longer need the structure. Well, I, I don't know if anybody else on the board has any thoughts about it, but I would like to uh, at least discuss whether we're comfortable with it becoming a permanent structure or whether it's we need to have some sort of stipulation of how and when it or you know the conditions under which it could be it should be removed so uh, Chris has her hand up but before I would have to say that that parking lot when we when Maria and I were there meeting with with uh, Cara um, it was it was quite full so I imagine that you would you know appreciate the additional parking if you didn't really need the shed so uh, it, it is an interesting uh, uh, question that that Doug uh, brings up. So, uh, Chris, am I muted? Can't tell. Yes. No. I hear you. So sometimes the board has put um, a condition on that says in a certain number of months or a certain number of years, the applicant will return to the board and explain what is going on with the situation. So you might consider saying, here it is, September two thousand twenty maybe um, the applicant returns in September of 2021 to tell you um, what is going on with the shed and whether they will be removing it soon or whether they need it for a longer amount of time. And I'm just you know, throwing a year out for your consideration. Could mean nine months or six months or just some period of time that they come back and um, explain to you what their situation is and whether they continue to need the shed or not. Um, and then I would say like with that observation that Maria, who has her hand up, it's also, they seem to be exceedingly uh, more busy than they would normally because of the pandemic. And maybe that's why the parking lot maybe is, you know, you know, under, you know, higher demand than it would normally. But uh, Maria? Um, let's see. Um, I think that, yeah, what you just said, Jack, makes sense. Like right now they're pretty busy, but I think a lot of people take public transportation, but I remember reading in the application or somewhere that there was some overflow parking, um, but I'm not as concerned with this uh, visually. Um, it's not something like that's similar to other projects that we were told that were um, temporary and they've been there for years. Um, so, you know, if it were to stay, I'm not, it doesn't seem to impose on like the streetscape or anything, but as far as parking, um, yeah, I think it's more of a functional uh, <clears throat> question for for um, the survival center staff. Um, I'm not sure if there are big events where suddenly the, the parking is um, not quite adequate, but uh, 
But yeah, as far as the way it looks and the way it blends in with the building, um, and it's not, you know, against the street, it's not too much of an eyesore compared to um, some other projects that we've had to, you know, let kind of continue because they need the temporary structure. So um, I'm comfortable uh, with what Chris suggested, actually, if you wanted to set a date, but, um, and then have them come back to us, but um, it's not um, problematic in my mind. Thank you, Murray. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a good suggestion, Doug, and I agree with Chris's recommendation to, to have um, to have the survival center come back and, and kind of brief us on how things went. I think it'd also be just very useful as a as a board for us to understand sort of this the status of your services. Um, so I, I think that's I think that's a really good suggestion. I I did though have one other question which I forgot about earlier. I'd mentioned about if this is something that's going to be carried throughout the winter. We talked about sort of how it's heated. Will it be electrified? I knew you'd mentioned kind of bringing um, potentially extension cords over, but I guess is that is that something that we should consider in terms of a, more of a longer term viability through winter months? I imagine you're going to want to have some sort of electricity in there for heating or lighting. Um, that would be my only additional comment. May I reply? Yes. All right. At this time, we don't see the need for. Um, making the structure feel more permanent in the sense of having heat, having electricity. The hours in which it's being used are daylight hours, even in the winter, that we don't foresee the need for lighting specifically. Um, and the windows in which volunteers are working in that space are usually a couple of hours. So certainly the volunteers that we recruit for those outside positions, obviously they'll need to dress warmly. Um, but the window in which people are out there is relatively short and those volunteer shifts are short. So we're not anticipating the need for heat either. Um, we do really see this as a, as a temporary structure uh, to help us get through the pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, and and um, Cara, your, your operating hours are... are when Currently noon to three. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we've just initiated um, our Saturday hours, the third Saturday of the month. We're open solely for the pantry. Okay, so those will be daylight hours even during the winter then? Even in winter, yes. Um, Janet has her hand up, Janet. So when Doug was talking about the, um, whether we should put a condition in, um, you know, to have it removed. I did draft some language for that. Um, and so we could put that in as a condition. I was kind of, I mean, I do, I have been to the survival center during their normal operations and they do have a need for parking because people come by cars and stay longer because they're eating or using their services. So I could see how the survival center would like to remove the structure as soon as the pandemic is over. They may want to move it to a different spot on the site, you know, having the bay doors opening in the back to a slope doesn't seem like fantastic to me, but I think in terms of ventilation, it makes a lot of sense because it's not just droplets we're worrying about, we're worrying about aerosols and you know people in close proximity, we need to protect the staff. And so I, would, I, I, I feel like it's a good idea there as temporary structure. We could say, come back in a year, you know, or hopefully three months, I mean, hopefully, you know, whatever, and we'll talk about it again, or we can just say, you have to remove it when you resume your normal operations, you know, inside services, uh, food services, food distribution and community operations. And so I feel like, you know, and the, the question I had in thinking this through for Chris was, you know, if, if we had a condition saying you have to remove it and then they wanted to keep it or move it somewhere else, could they still do it within this application? Would they make a separate one? Or if we just granted you know, the approval and said, come back and talk to us in a year, could a modification also be made? Like what's the easiest way to kind of switch things around if, it, if things change? Um, before calling Chris, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'm looking, I don't, I don't think there's any alternatives uh, to moving it on the site because it is pretty small and it's 
it's got the slopes off the parking lot and things like that. But um, mm -hmm. uh, Chris, would you comment, please? Um, I would just like to say that you can't change or add conditions after the fact. So whatever conditions you put on tonight are the conditions un unless the applicant comes back with a new application okay. and for you to change one of the conditions. So having a condition that is kind of flexible may be the best way to deal with this. Um, such as, you know, come back in a year and tell us what you're going to do. Or adding the language that you just suggested that the shed goes away when the survival center renews its um, normal operations or some combination of those two things. Okay. Doug, please. Uh, well, two things. One is um, I work at an institution where we have temporary buildings that have been there for 30 years. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'm uh, sensitive to that, that kind of situation. Um, so uh, my second item was, Jack, would it make sense to make a motion or should we close, con you know, close the discussion? Um, I'd be happy to make a motion that we approve the application uh, with the conditions that the applicant return within a year and tell us uh, what what's going on uh, and whether they still need the, the building and that uh, you know that we require it to be removed within 18 months unless uh, they demonstrate that they still need the the, the, the building yeah, I was thinking the same. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe bumping that out a little bit, a little bit longer. I'm, I'm sure they're making a, an investment just to get the shut up there, you know, number one, but uh, um, that's, you know, open for discussion. Uh, any other board members have any comments on that or want to second Doug's motion? Andrew? Yeah, I, I would second that. I think the 18 month timing gets us through like two winter seasons. So that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, so I, I, I would second the, the motion as Doug's articulated it. Good. Um, Chris, can you help me out here? Uh, do we need more public comment or go to a vote or? You can go to a vote. It doesn't look like there's any uh, okay. anyone who's wanting to make public comment. All right, so we'll do a, a roll call. Uh, are you closing the public hearing? Uh -huh. Did the motion include closing the public hearing and um, uh, that this and making the finding that this application meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw and that you're willing to grant the waivers that were requested and with the conditions um, drafted? Uh, I did not state any of that, but I'm happy to have that included in the motion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. So what? You no. Know, so we're we're looking to vote to approve what has been proposed and the items that Chris spoke of and, and close the hearing for SBR 2021-01. Correct. Okay. So roll call. Um, Janet. Approve. And Andrew. Approve. And Doug? Approve. Maria? Approve. Tom? Approve. And myself approve. That's six zero. And I have to admit that, you know, I'm so happy I made the site visit because what you guys do is under the radar, especially for the people that live in South Amherst like myself. And thank you for everything that you guys do. It, it's, it's a huge contribution to the community. 
Thank you. We really appreciate your support and uh, we're happy to meet the criteria that you've proposed and we'll look forward to giving you an update on how well it's working. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And we have another public hearing and on the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, 21 Mattoon Street. And I'm just wondering about the participants. Are we, uh, are they queued up, Pam? Uh, ben Harrington is representing the school system. And okay. there the others there as well. I'm not sure. Molly Ryan Strayhorn, I don't really know if she's representing the school system too. She is okay. here. We, I, I just um, asked Ben Harrington to become a panelist. Maybe he can answer that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was like um, in the process of coming in. I, I heard part of that. What was the, what was the rest of it? Is Molly Ryan Strayhorn part of your um, presentation representing no. the school? No, okay. Okay, so uh, let me go through the introduction here. And okay, so it's like I have 712, um, it was to begin at 645, so we're good there. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the uh, purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021-02, Amherst Pelham Regional School District at 21 Mattoon Street. Uh, they request a site plan review approval to erect three temporary accessory tent structures for breakout and expanded instructional space and associated site improvements under section three, uh, 330.0 nonprofit educational institution of the zoning bylaw at the Amherst Regional, uh, Amherst Pelham Regional High School, which is in the RG zoning district. It's map 11D parcel 215. Mm -hmm. Are there any board member disclosures? I see none. And Ben, welcome. And uh, would you like to provide a presentation. Yeah, a, a very, very brief one is, uh, so what we're proposing based on our, uh, our new educational needs in, in terms of facilities, what, what we're offering or, or proposing is to, is to erect three 30 by 30 tents with canopy, no sidewalls whatsoever, no power will be necessary. And we're, we're actually even not even allowing furniture necessarily so that there'll be spaces where, where the students will go out they'll have some sort of instruction in there perhaps but the main purpose will be for mass breaks and then one-on-one -on -one attention for our special needs students in the PIP program Summit Academy and then the Ames program that'll be at the high school the uh, the only real modifications we'll we'll need to make is, is in terms of accessibility building in uh, small temporary walkways and the, and the, uh, the intent is to keep them up until weather prevents us from continuing to have them up. So, so I, we, we don't anticipate them going, staying up very far into the winter, if at all. So is, are, are the walkways, you know, have like an ADA compliance aspect to them or, um, cause yeah, we, 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 we had the site visit and Marie and I can talk about that, but um, yeah. um, what's your understanding of, of, of the access to these areas? So yes, especially based on the, uh, the uh, population that we're, we're intending to serve here, uh, a number of folks will need uh, wheelchair access and, and these sorts of things. So we're trying to accommodate that as, as best we can. Okay. Within within ADA guidelines. All right. And um, 
Let me see in our packet. Uh, switch over here. Um, yeah, so um, Maria, do you, you want to discuss this or? Jack, Chris Maybe. also has her hand raised. Chris Breastrap. Oh, I'm sorry. Chris, please. I just wondered, um, I think only one of these tents um, is going to have a, a path to it. The others are all adjacent to an existing path. You might want to ask Mr. Harrington to clarify that. Yes, Ben. Yeah, I, yeah, I can clarify. So they, they're actually all adjacent to pathways. One of them has a, we're in the process of, of kind of recovering from the demolition from the modulars that we had there. And we're, we're going to continue that pathway in a, a bit more. But, but our goal is to, to actually have access off of the path. And since, since we can't actually, because of the guide ropes, we won't be able to kind of, you know, abut it directly. So we're going to have a little bit of a gap. And we'd like to cover that with an accessible walkway. Or not walkway, but path. Okay. Is that, are you good, Chris? Thank you. Okay. Um, and Janet, do you, I'm wondering if we should do the, the site visit report. Yeah. Unless you, okay, all right. Um, Maria, do you, you want to roll with this or? You, yeah, you yeah, so real yeah. briefly, um, we walked there and um, as Ben said, there were some crew or they were from Berkshire Gas maybe, but there it was clear that they had removed, if you have that, a map that says site three, site two, site one, the two big white rectangles are already gone. And it looked like um, there was a lot of sort of soil that had been upturned there. And um, the pathways, the existing walkways are currently asphalt, I believe, um, I think. And uh, we kind of walked where site three and site two are. And um, it's pretty clear back there, like it shows on the aerial, there are no trees. And <clears throat> uh, it looks like it's gonna be pretty close to the building and that only site three, no, site one, as a proposed gravel walkway. I think the others don't say proposed walkways, but um, it all looked pretty clear and um, that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it was a little confusing because there are two modular buildings close to site three, I think that are, um, I think they're in the photo, they're just hard to see, they're under the letter S maybe, but um, it looked like there was already some prep work going on to um, get ready for the tents. Thank you, Marie. Um, so we can open up uh, questions from the board. And we have Janet, please. So I have a question, Ben, whether you might need these again in the spring. Um, and so, you know, the kind of the question that Doug brought up in the last presentation of how long do you think you might need the tents? It sounds like you're not planning to um, run them through the winter months, but do you think you might need to put them up again in the spring? And so I'm wondering if we want to add that as a condition saying, you know, about the length of time, you know, kind of on your need basis. But I don't, it seems kind of weird to have you come back again, you know, in February saying, okay, we need them for April and stuff, so. Yeah, so interestingly enough, that's kind of a, a topic of debate for us, you know, with, with all the uncertainty. We're, we're kind of moving forward with the assumption that, that the pandemic won't be over and that the, the need for these uh, outdoor spaces will, will continue to be there mm -hmm. through the spring. So yeah, if it were possible to allow us to do that through the spring, and I, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking we would want those to be taken down you know, after school is out of session since, I mean, they wouldn't necessarily serve a purpose for us through the summer months. Okay. Doug, please. Yeah, I was wondering whether we should just impose the same 18 months and just, that would get you through three semesters and just say, uh, you know, we'd approve you're using this for up to 18 months or, you know, having these tents uh, in that location for 18 months. And then if you need to extend it beyond that, that you come back and, you know, we'll 
have another conversation, but that might just save us having a hearing next spring or next summer. Um, you know, and we can talk about other things in our meetings. <laughs> that, that definitely sounds fair. So I, I guess in terms of the, the, the tents surviving uh, the winter, are there concerns in terms of them, you know, being able to hold up to snow loads and, and wind factors and things like that? Is, is it the right structure that you're looking for? Yeah, so, so based on what, what we've learned from the manufacturer, what, what they, they initially tested one of these for, I think it was like a 24 month period they left it standing in, in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But, um, but our, our actual concern about them during the winter would be in terms of things like snow removal and, and these sorts of things and, and the fact that we would be required to actually clear those areas and the tents wouldn't be used. So it's, it's more of a, I don't want to say it's a, a matter of convenience for us, but kind of sort of is. But the, the, the structures can, can withhold winter conditions is your understanding. Correct. If, if need be, they could. Right. Uh, Tom? Yeah, sure. I had a similar question, Jack, just in terms of, um, you know, how these are, are rated for safety and who's installing them and how we can guarantee safety with those installs, with what kinds of winds and what are the stipulations that they're taking down in case they become dangerous. So I'm just curious, you know, because it's um, essentially a sale um, and that there's children out there, <laughs> um, what a, what a, what is the process for, or what has been? Um, are there any limitations that you guys are setting on terms of when these would come down, if weather were coming, and things like that? And just a little bit curious about um, how we're thinking about these over the course of the spring, from a safety perspective. Ben, so, yeah. So, so in terms of uh, actually mounting them, no, they they are. These are significantly weighted frame tents. So I, I don't have the exact specs for you as, as, as in terms of like how much of a wind gust that they, they would stay uh, rooted in, but we plan on staking and weighting them for, the, for those purposes. And in terms of installation, it, it would be our maintenance department. They've kind of been doing a lot of more research, I, I imagine, than they would want to, but yeah, so it would definitely be in-house and yeah, I, I, I don't have an actual wind, like a mile per hour rating. Um, Tom, do you have any? Okay, um, Andrew. Yeah, hi Ben. I was just wondering, um, can this can these tent models support this like side panels? And and if so, like wouldn't that be something you would be interested in doing to? To try to lengthen the the use period of this into colder weather, or inclement weather. Yeah, so so they're they're absolutely designed for sidewalls, and it, there's a variety of uh, different types. But our our kind of concern is, is the idea of having an, an open space, like with the aerosol considerations, right? Right. We really want a constant flow. So we discussed it, and, and our nurse manager kind of came to the conclusion that the safest alternative would be to have them wide open and, and also there, there are issues of like egress that would arise with that that we would have to plan for as well makes sense okay so you, you wouldn't anticipate coming back in november or december and saying we really would like to put those panels up i i don't but um the, the predictability of our school community and the requests isn't something i would necessarily hedge my bet on, but the plan that we've given back to the district is that they would be only used up until November and that no sidewalls would be involved. Okay, and then and then one other quick one is just, and you touched on it a little bit actually, is um, is, this, is this a recommendation that's entirely developed by the school or did you solicit feedback from parents or teachers uh, for how we, how, how you might want to manage this? Right. Yeah, we we got a uh, copious input from uh, administrators, teachers, and, and some families that that were once they heard about the the plan to do it, were kind of in support of it. But 
yeah, it, a lot of district discussion kind of went into the request. Prime, would you say it's going to be primarily for student use or administrative use or it's a free-for-all? Well, hopefully not a free-for-all. We're, we're, uh, you know we're, I mean? we're, we're, right, right. We're, we're intending it for, for predominantly student use. And, and uh, at least two of the populations that would be using that would have you know, um, staff monitoring while they're there. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. But, you know, it is interesting that we just had the one hearing with someone converting a tent to a shed <laughs> and here you have tents and I, I guess there's a little bit of concern about the survivability of this through a winter season but uh, uh, Doug Marshall yeah uh, kind of a couple of comments about some of the discussion so far I assume first of all that if you know high winds or a hurricane or a tornado was predicted you would simply not allow people to be out in that tent because if it failed in some way, you don't want to have anybody under it. Oh, is that absolutely. is that is that a reasonable assumption that you would, you know, restrict access in the event of high winds? Very much so. And if it was, and if we anticipated, you know, extreme high winds, we would even probably try to take the canopies themselves off leaving the frame so that, you know, air could pass through without lifting and sending it off. Okay, great. And then the second question, I, I guess from the original discussion, I thought that these tents would probably be taken down in November. And if they were needed in the spring, they might be put back up in April. Uh, but that the structure and the fabrics would not be left out in the weather all through the winter. Is that true, or, or do you plan to leave it up all the way through the winter? No, we, we plan on taking them down. We've, we've even kind of worked on storage provisions throughout the summer, keeping some space open for them. Okay, great. That's, that's what I thought. That's all I had. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Chris, do you have an in? Oh, I just wanted to say that the, um, the tents will require uh, a permit from inspection services. So I think some of the concerns that people are um, raising about, you know, the sturdiness of the tents and, you know, other things like fire retardancy and things like that will be looked at um, when the building inspectors look at the uh, permit for erecting the tent. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Mm. Um. I'm sorry, Ben, but I cannot find my email that said this. Um, is it true that the middle school and high school kids don't start till November as far as in-person teaching, but it's all online until November? So the, the bulk of them, yes, but the, uh, our, our special needs ELL mm -hmm. and uh, PIP program students, they'll be coming back physically on October 1st. Gotcha. Okay. So it's really only like a month window that you're going to be having students and staff use the tents. Okay. Right. Yeah, I just, I, for a second, I thought, do I have this wrong? Are they starting earlier than I think? But um, yeah, I can't find the email. So by the time the high schoolers come back for November classes, it may be too cold or too late to be using them for that purpose, but you have other staff and students who'll be using them before then. That's correct. Okay. Good. Um, I see no other hands raised from the board. We can open this up to public comment. Pam, I see none. Is that? I'm not seeing any either. Okay. No. All righty. Well, uh, any final comments amongst the board? Anyone want to make a motion with conditions, perhaps? Doug Marshall has his hand raised, Jack. Doug, please. Okay, I was going to, this will probably be a half a motion, just like before, because Chris knows all the technical terms. <laughs> um, 
I move that we approve the application from the uh, public schools for the for the tent that we require that it be removed and not re-erected within 18 months of our approval uh, unless they return and request an extension. I guess I, I do remember I'm supposed to also move that we close the public hearing. Yes. And that leaves only a couple of things for Chris to say. Yeah. <laughs> and to find that the um, proposal meets the relevant criteria of 11.24, section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. So moved. Very good. Anyone want a second? Second. Maria? Who was that? Maria. Yeah, that was me. Maria. Second. All right. Uh, any other further comment from the board? If not, we will do a roll call. Um, so, Andrew? Approve. And Maria? Approve. Tom? Uh, approve. And Janet? Approve. Doug? Aye. And myself approve. And that's uh, unanimous, 6-0. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. You're on the school committee, right? Yep, I'm actually heading from here to the school committee. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well, pleased uh, to meet you. So thank you, you too. Thank you for all your, your efforts on that end, too. Thank you. Um, and that concludes that. Mm -hmm. And the agenda, what do we got next here? So Mr. Reedy. Okay, Applebrook Cluster Subdivision. And I'm going to ask him to come on over. There he is. And the panelists. Hello, Mr. Reedy. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Hey. Hi, Tom. Hey, Jack. How are you? Very good. Thank good. you. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, um, can you help me out what we, how we proceed here? Well, originally, Mr. Reedy came to you in the beginning of the summer to ask for um, an exchange of lots. He wanted to have one lot released and have the other lot put under covenant. And um, after discussion and after a suggestion by Janet McGowan, um, you decided to put lot seven under covenant. So that's the only lot that is currently being held by the covenant. And Mr. Reedy said that he would come back in August, late August, to tell us whether he um, wanted to um, provide a bond to the town to complete the subdivision road or whether he um, wanted to keep lot seven under the covenant or alternatively, whether he wanted to complete the road. So he's here to um, talk about that and to update you all on his, on the plans uh, for that roadway. Okay. Uh, I guess, I don't know if there's any board member disclosures. I, I, in a general sense, I have, you know, worked with Tom on, on, other projects that that um, have not come in front of the board, um, but that doesn't compromise my my you know decision making on this particular project. So, um, and you Andy's did done a wonderful job too. And you did. <laughs> <laughs> I have no financial interest. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Deck filed an, a de declaration of that with his appointing authority. Yeah. And that's on file. So, uh, so Tom, with that, would you like to make a presentation, please? Yeah, uh, sure. So it'll probably be short, hopefully sweet. Um, Chris gave great background and the board, frankly, helped us out. We were up against a closing deadline, had requested the release of one lot. Um, 
and uh, transferring that covenant to another lot. Through discussion, it was transferred to a lot that we had not suggested, but we were okay with. That was lot seven. Um, so that allowed the closing to go through. So thank you for that. And then as Chris noted, I was gonna come back and make one of a, a couple of requests. And so since then, a, a couple of things. One, we've got the number from Jason Skeels of what he thinks it would cost to, to finish everything. And I think it's around $50,000, some, something like that. Um, but we're happy to keep the covenant on lot seven for the time being. And the time being should be no more than this fall. So uh, the applicant, Paul Cole, um, is looking to do or have the work done in the fall to finish ev everything that he has to finish. And so then hopefully I'm coming to you either this winter or in a worst case scenario next spring at some point, asking for release of that lot seven with sign off from Jason Skeels that everything has been done um, according to the plan. So, so really it's just a status quo at this point, keep lot seven and uh, we should be done, you know, before the snow flies, assuming it doesn't fly till December. Pam, do we have any, any um, public comment? No, no. Do we have any uh, visuals? Slides. Yes. 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 So. Well, I think you have a map of the um, subdivision. I'm not sure that I did that, Chris. Let's see. It's in the packet. Okay. There it is. Yep. Number 19. There you go. Number 19 and number seven is the one that's shaped like a, a pork chop or a flag mm -hmm. line. Whoops. Sorry, something happened. Hold on, bear with me. Hmm. Every time I try to uh, make it bigger. Just advance the page. If you get a slideshow, you can just advance the page. Okay. Share. I think people can see it. I don't think you need to make it bigger. You're almost there. Here it is. There you go. Okay. Great. So oh, just plot seven. Yeah, that's it for context. That's the one that is under covenant right now. I mean, when you when you look at the entire subdivision, that there are you know, there's fifty thousand dollars of work remaining. Um, and there's still, you know, other lots to be sold, but particularly lot seven, which I would suggest has the value of at least $50,000. Um, so, you know, I, we believe that the town is, has been, is, and will remain to be secured. And then um, additionally, we expect to have the work done this fall. So um, that, that should take care of it. And, I think like we noted last time, there was some discussion. It's, it's, this is a private way. So the town is never going to be asked to take this road as a public way and be responsible for its maintenance. It's the responsibility of the homeowners association. Uh, and I think that was pretty explicit in the approval that the, the board gave. Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you have anything more to add before we open this up to the board? No, I don't. Okay. Um, board members, Janet? Janet, you're muted. I said, th I was saying thank you for the presentation and I'm happy to hear that the work is probably gonna be done this fall or you know by the end of the spring. Um, I wonder, um, so this sounds great to me, and it sounds like this is a short part of our agenda. I wonder, we might, um, just talking more to the board and to Jack and Christine, if we can get an update on Amherst Hills, maybe at the next meeting, in terms of, because this part of what 
you went through on this project is because of what's been happening on Amherst Hill. So just it just sparks me and reminds me that we need to check in on that. That's all. Um, I any other board members? Chris, you're not a board member, but I'll call on you. <laughs> I'm just wanting to clarify what uh, Janet asked for. Are you asking Mr. Reedy to come back and give an update on um, Amherst Hills? Or are you asking me to give an update on Amherst Hills? I guess Mr. Reedy isn't really in a position to do that because he represents the homeowners and he doesn't represent the um, yeah. developer in this case. It was, it was for you, Chris. It wasn't, it just, it all reminded me that we haven't talked about that, so. Okay, I'll try, I'll see what kind of information I can get. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Janet, unrelated to this project, but. <laughs> uh, and, okay, so uh, public comment. Do you see anything, Pam? I am checking. I am not. I don't either. Okay. So um, this seems pretty solid in terms of what's being proposed. Uh, Jason Skeels is on board with this, correct, Chris? I haven't had a conversation with Jason. He provided the um, cost estimate, which is, I think, 53000 to finish the road. But he hasn't really offered any comments um, other, oh, no, it's 58000 sorry. Um, and we asked him to do that in case um, the applicant, the developer, chose to submit a bond instead of, um, in, in lieu of having the lot um, be kept as part of the covenant. Um, but I haven't heard anything from Jason. Would you like me to speak with him about the status of the road? Uh, I'm going to call on Doug. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm thinking that we were fine with holding the original lot, and that had been held for some number of months or years without any monitoring on our part. We've now switched to another lot that's probably equal if not greater value. So I think we should leave Tom and the developer alone and let them, you know, finish selling the rest of the lots and finish the road and, you know, let, let things work their way through without asking anybody to come back. Um, that, you know, I, I, if I, if this were a kind of thing we'd make a motion for, I'd move that we close the hearing and move on to the next thing on the agenda. But since I, a motion is not needed, I'll just say, I think we should close this and let Tom go back to whatever he wanted to do this evening and uh, move on to the next thing. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Chris, what, what are we, uh, what's the end game here? from the planning board's perspective for this particular uh, item? It's really just to keep um, getting updates, I guess, from Mr. Reedy periodically. Um, mm -hmm. Since the town doesn't have a, um, a role in taking the road, you know, you hope that at some point that it does get finished um, and you don't want it to start to deteriorate like the roads in Amherst Hills. Um, but it seems like the lots are selling quickly and the houses are being built quickly. We've heard from Mr. Reedy that the developer intends to sell two lots every year you know, with houses on them. So I don't know if, if you need to feel, you know, terribly pressured to do anything at this point. Okay, is it requiring a vote? No. Okay. Require a vote. No, this is just an update. An update, okay. Um, I see no other hands. Uh, so uh, are we recommending 
that he proceed uh, as proposed? Does that require a vote or um, well, looking for guidance here? <laughs> okay, so Mr. I think Mr. Marshall is correct. You 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 had lot four um, under covenant for a while. I think since 2017 or 18. And then you switched to lot seven, and you weren't really concerned about this subdivision during that time period of those few years. Um, so, you know, when Mr. Reedy wants something from you, when he wants to be able to sell lot seven, he's going to come back to you with a proposal. And the proposal will be either the roadway is done, and Jason Skills thinks it's in good condition, or he'll say, we're willing to give you a bond for whatever it's going to cost someone to finish the road. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, you have, you kind of have the cards because you have lot seven and eventually they're going to want to develop lot seven. Are, are you concerned that we're going to run into the same situation that we did with Amherst Hills? No, no, I'm just trying to, uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get clear in my mind, the, the, uh, relationship. The, we have lot seven, but then there's a mention of the bond and uh, I'm like, I'm just a little confused about. Well, it's up to the developer to determine what form of surety he wants to offer to the town. Okay. He offered a covenant initially. And then he asked for release of lots, which you granted, and you kept um, the covenant on one of those lots as surety. And the okay. lots are probably worth something between $100,000 and $150,000. Which so more than covers the $50,000 that we're talking about for the road. More than covers the $50,000. Yeah. So the incentive is, you know, the, the developer has the incentive to sell that lot and probably to, you know, potentially to make money building a house on that lot. Um, and it okay. seems like it's, you know, they're, they're going relatively quickly, going more quickly than perhaps lots in Amherst Hills are going. So I don't have concerns about this um, particular subdivision at this time. Okay, so it's kind of a no-brainer anyway for us to move on. <laughs> Do we need to approve anything or recommend or? Uh... Mr. McDougall has his hand up. I, um, yes, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, I had a, a real simple question. I'm not. I'm not trying to delay this at all. But just when, when, when is the road finished? Like, would it be finished after completion of the house on Lot Seven, or prior to that? Because I, I, I believe I'd read, and I know just the, you know, concerns around moving heavy equipment on that finished road. So when would it actually be completed? So we anticipate. Uh, Hi, Andrew. Nice to meet you. I like Likewise, Tom. Um, so we anticipate completing it before lot seven. I mean, um, I think this this year is when we look to complete it. I don't know that that includes top coat. It may. Um, I've got to talk to my client about just the, the logistics and the sequencing of it. Um, I don't know that. I mean, lot seven is towards the beginning, and so the, the any heavy vehicles probably would be, you know, it's not like you would have an excavator using those tines on the pavement. They would probably go back into the lot anyway. So I don't see it as being a, a big issue. Um, and that's why I think the idea is just get it all done, finish it this fall. Um, and then, you know, at some point, probably in the spring to get lot seven released. Great. All right. No, thanks, Tom. Sure. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Chris, do you have another comment? I'm sorry, no, I don't. Okay. All right, so I, I, I guess uh, we, we, we can move on from this without a vote and kind of a tacit uh, approval of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Then I'll Help say me, thank Chris. you. Good, good, <laughs> it's good, good to see everybody and All right. be well, and hopefully we see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay. All right.
So um, I'm looking at the agenda here. Give me a moment. But it looks like we're um, taking this next item on the old business is uh, status of zoning subcommittee. So um, it is 7.50 now. I think we're doing pretty good on time. So we definitely can, you know, contribute a half hour or more to this because there isn't really uh, much more I, uh, to re that I see coming up uh, with our meeting. So, um, Chris, are we having any visitors with regard to like Mandy or, or Dave Zomack? It doesn't look like or, it. Okay, all right. Like so, uh, we, we did have uh, a briefing, at least I had a briefing with, with Mandy Joe yesterday to understand. And then uh, Janet had emailed the, the flow chart for the zoning subcommittee. And I, um, I guess if anything, that would be a nice thing to throw up, uh, Pam, yep. uh, that, that flow chart. But so for Andrew and Tom, the zoning subcommittee um, has been operating for who knows how many years and it was geared you know as you know, within a function of serving up zoning amendments to town meeting and when we had um, it was staffed normally by two or three people um, I think people uh, Rob Crowner was one of them uh, Greg Stutzman um, they were they were good. The amendments the amendments were quite small, and you know in, in you know in general, but they were they were very good at what they were doing. Um, and Chris Brestrup was always a part of the zoning subcommittee, and and that required um, you know it required her time, and so the whole proposal now. Um, of whether zoning subcommittee, which really hasn't met officially for, for a period of time now, six months or so, because we have the CRC, which is the community resources. Chris, help me, what's the full? Oh, the CRC is the community resources committee of the town council. Oh, yeah, community resources committee. Okay, so anyway, they, they also, they're the, the legislative body now, you know, within Amherst. Um, and they, and that particular committee, their charge is to oversee, oversee uh, planning issues, including the zoning bylaw and the master plan. Um, and there's been uh, discussion of whether, you know, what we do do with the zoning subcommittee because the the items that the zoning subcommittee previously took on. Um, are it's no longer again delivering a product to town meeting, which again was was its focus before. Now we have the zoning bylaws being worked on primarily by Rob Mora, who is the building commissioner, and uh, Chris Brestrup's staff, and and so now it's it's just and Chris has also been assigned now to attend to the CRC as a liaison. Um, and so she's got only so many hats that she can wear at one time. The zoning subcommittee really is something that is, doesn't seem to be in the flow of the process with regard to how our zoning bylaws are gonna be uh, changed. But that does not say that the, our planning board doesn't have, you know, isn't heavily invested in terms of the the zoning zoning bylaw changes itself. So, so it's just it, it seems like the zoning subcommittee has uh, has devolved to less of a working committee. Um, and I think at this time, I know Andrew has his hand up, but I'm wondering if because I'm not a part of the zoning subcommittee, if I could have Maria speak a little bit. Uh, to this and and actually even instead of the the flowchart maybe put up Maria's uh, 
memo and then we can have Janet speak. Uh, Andrew, if that's okay with you. Okay. All right. Yeah, Jack, you touched on all the points that I want to make, which is, um, you know, since we changed our government from town meeting to town council, <clears throat> they're trying to get their feet under them. And so while they were doing that, the previous zoning subcommittee, Greg Stutzman, Rob Crowner, and I made this big priorities chart. <clears throat> and we had three zoning amendment articles sort of ready to like get town council their first taste of what it might be to do a zoning revision. And after a lot of, um, I think a lot of discussions among them and CRC, they finally settled on, don't give us any zoning amendment articles right now, we've got too much. And then some time passed and then um, a lot of uh, members changed and we, I as a zoning subcommittee chair decided, well, let's just work on things we're passionate about that we could also propose as zoning amendments. Um, we tried that and again, they, I think that's previous flow chart um, showed there's a lot of steps in that process and we actually got sort of eliminated <laughs> and um, and that and that's fine because I honestly feel like there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen right now. My memo basically spells that out where number one town council are their elected officials they're really interested in proposing zoning amendments ideas and priorities. They are the ones tasked with this. Um, we're volunteers we're in fact you know, volunteers on the planning board where we are then, yeah, referred zoning amendments, but um, some other sort of higher up group is gonna be setting the priorities for us. So <clears throat> I think it'd be great if we had a planning board uh, discuss zoning issues as a group. And I think now, especially we have new members, it would be great to get a lot more perspectives and new ideas and new eyes on <clears throat> what we've been going through. Sorry, I just inhaled the burger. I'm <laughs> really, <laughs> I feel really sick. Um, the second point, Rob Mora, like you said, Jack, he is um, doing a lot of really fine, fine, you know, he and Chris and the staff um, know the zoning bylaw inside and out. They deal with it day by day and they know where the flaws are. They know where the inconsistencies are. It makes total sense for them to take the lead on those kinds of things. When it becomes meteor issues, like, you know, that are controversial or need um, consultants or needs town council or CRC as input, of course, they're not gonna, you know, plow for it. They're gonna seek guidance. And so again, there was a, you know, Rob came to the ZSC and said, you know, how about we work this way? And I said, great, I'm happy to help. We went to the planning board. Some planning board members said, why are we adding all these extra steps in this process? Let's make it simpler. And so again, the ZSC was sort of like, well, let's just, bypass that extra stuff. Let's just do planning board, Rob Mora, and let it go there. And then now it's even involved even further to now to Rob Mora and I think CRC. So <clears throat> I'm going to stay out of that process. But basically what I'm saying is, you know, every time the ZSC tries to, you know, say we're going to be, you know, proactive and do some work, the higher ups sort of define the process. And that's totally fine. That's their, their that's their, you know, reason why they're there. They are sort of setting priorities and process. So Again, that was just another reason why the ZSC was sort of, uh, I think, falling by the wayside. The third point, which um, sadly, Mr. Burt Whistle was not brought back, but he actually was one of the people who said he'd really love to have more discussions with the planning board on zoning article issues. And so I thought, why have a small discussion when we could have a bigger discussion, especially if our agendas get lighter in load like they were tonight? set aside half an hour, 45 minutes and discuss things that we're, you know, interested in changing and thinking about discussing and um, possibly, you know, if town council, uh, if CRC comes to us with, you know, we had just given them like our top three lists. If they come to us again and say, what have you guys been discussing or interested in, you know, who knows? So I'd, I'd love to have more people sort of um, in a discussion in that way. And then the fourth point, which I feel like actually should be number one, which is the planning department staff are so overloaded. We're planning board is only one of their many things they have to deal with. And then zoning subcommittee is another, it would be another sort of drain on their time and, um, and for not a very effective sort of outcome, I feel. And the fifth one, Jack, you touched on, which is Rob and Greg, and I think Steve Schreiber were um, the zoning subcommittee for almost a decade. And they, um, Rob actually wrote zoning bylaw articles and zoning bylaw text, which I think is unusual. I'm not 
standard practice, but he just was really good at it and he enjoyed it. And <laughs> I think Chris and um, really appreciated it because uh, he's just, you know, that kind of mind. And so I am speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for Janet McGowan, but I am not at, at that level. And so I am afraid if we did do things like that, that it would all be planning department. It would be on their shoulders. And then if we said we need consultants, then of course, planning department again has a deal with consultants. So it's just, there's so many things that we're saying, uh, we're an extra step that's not really needed right now. Um, in the future, maybe when we are given a sort of definitive direction or priority, it'd be great to have the zoning subcommittee reform and then have new members and have um, more discussions, you know, really technical discussions. But right now, because we aren't really given a, uh, a direction yet, and um, we're not, I don't think we're the ones sort of setting that direction. It just didn't make sense to have yet another subcommittee that was going to um, meet at this time. So I, I would say let's, you know, not dissolve it because there were some emails from the public saying, what a shame, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Um, but I, I think they're a little misled in that it's not the same ZSC it has been in the past. And um, I would like to see maybe in the spring or summer <clears throat> when priorities get set that maybe we do consider again um, who wants to be on that committee and who wants to take on whatever priorities CRC gives us. Um, but for now, it just doesn't make sense for us to move that forward. Um, I hope I didn't talk too long, but that's the gist of where I'm coming from and what I've been through for the last five years, maybe, on the ZSC. <clears throat> that was very helpful, Maria. Thank you. Okay. You summarized that nice. And uh, Chris, did you you have a point of clarification, or should I? I got Andrew yeah. and point Janet. Point of clarification, which is that um, in the past, the zoning subcommittee and the planning board worked very hard on zoning amendments and didn't really have any indication from town meeting whether town meeting thought that these things were priorities or not. So they would work hard on something and bring it to town meeting and then town meeting would vote against it in, in some cases, not, not in all cases. Um, now we have a chance to work with a group that is really part of town council. The CRC is made up of five members of town council who will be communicating with town council about what town council's priorities are. So we'll have a greater sense of what town council is likely to vote for. Um, so it's not really worth our time to work on things unless we have some sense that these things are priorities of town council or that they could be made priorities of town council. So having that communication with town council, I think is gonna be very helpful. And having the zoning subcommittee, you know, kind of working on a parallel track right now, I think is not um, going to be that helpful. I think it would be better to give, give a chance to um, staff working with CRC and with the planning board to develop zoning amendments. And then, you know, if you decide, if the planning board decides that, my goodness, it really would be best to have a zoning subcommittee at some point in the future, you can go back to that. So as Maria suggested, not dissolve it, but just put it to the side for a while, put it in a a hiatus, if you will, and decide later on if it would be worthwhile. And I think that now that we have, you know, three new planning board members, they're going to get, um, potentially get excited about zoning amendments. I never thought I would be, but um, I am. So, um, you know, that, that might give us a chance to uh, have more um, conversations and more um, interest in zoning on the part of the planning board. Um, so, so I'm, um, I'm recommending to move in the direction that Maria is suggesting. So Andrew and Janet have both have their hands up. I think Janet needs, because she's been uh, a strong proponent of, of uh, kind of the, uh, <laughs> I'm a lot of lost of words, but Janet would like to keep the, the zoning subcommittee going. So. I'm going to call on Janet. Thank you. Um, 
So I am the vice chair of the zoning subcommittee and Maria is the chair. And then Christine Gray Mullins was our third and Michael Burt Whistle was coming to a lot of meetings. And so I have gone to zoning subcommittee meetings for years as just a resident. And it was a really um, interesting dynamic of the zoning subcommittee would have everybody sitting around the table, you know, people from the bid would come, people from the community or neighborhoods would come and they would do a lot of very technical writing and working on um, zoning bylaws or just, you know, start formulating ideas. And, you know, and then, you know, I, I personally think the more eyes on something because people always see something. And so I found it very useful and I, 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 as a resident, I found it very useful. Sometimes people, residents would come to the zoning subcommittee like Jerry Weiss who wanted to make an adjustment for inclusionary zoning and that would be kind of workshop there. It's a place where like kind of the nitty gritty language of our very complicated bylaw is worked on. And the zoning subcommittee was working with the planning board, obviously going back and forth and also the planning department would also, you know, I mean, it's, it's like a, it was sort of a nice place to percolate I know our government has changed and I think nothing else has changed is that the planning board under state law has a role. We can bring um, zoning bylaw changes directly to the town council or town meeting. Um, we actually, that's what the planning board usually does in Amherst, that's the tradition. The CRC can bring, you know, under our new government, it can bring um, zoning bylaw changes to the town council, 10 registered voters can. I think there's probably some other group I'm forgetting. and so. I think the, the planning board, you know, we work closely with the planning department. We will work closely with the CRC. Um, I go to a lot of their meetings or re review them and I've been asking sort of the planning board to do a liaison to the CRC because they need direction and then they have direction and, you know, things to work on. So, you know, the zoning subcommittee didn't, didn't wither on the vine. We had COVID and we just stopped meeting. And I know that since we've had a new government, it's been super frustrating. I've only been on the zoning subcommittee for a year and half of that has been COVID. But you know, for six months, we were just trying to figure out how to work with town council. And I've also was attending the CRC meetings for over a year and they were trying to figure out how to work and what they were doing. And so a lot of our zoning subcommittee meetings, we'd be talking about very specific zoning changes, but a lot of it was what Maria was saying is like, how do we approach the town council? We were told by um, sort of the high command of town hall and town council, the town council can't handle it. And so we were holding back and then there was debates about whether we should just send the zoning changes on the multi-use buildings. And so a lot of our time was just kind of not figuring out how to glue in. Um, so then the COVID comes, or right before the COVID came, um, Rob Mora, the building inspector commissioner came to us and s talked about, um, the idea of rewriting the zoning bylaw at different levels. And during his presentation, which I think is in the March 4th minutes, he talked about working closely with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board for direction, hiring consultants. And, you know, you know, basically the tradition has been the planning board and the planning department work very closely together. Um, the zoning subcommittee isn't kind of floating out there on their own projects. We're all kind of working in. And so that was the presentation of Rob Mora. I'm not sure if that has changed and he's planning on working directly with the CRC, but literally on the CRC, there's only one person who's been on the planning board in that group. And so the planning board has a lot of expertise in this area. And so I, I just, I'm a little lost about process. And I, I often talk about process in planning board meetings. It seems like we, we, it's, we struggle to stick with one. I still think the CRC is in transition and not really sure of their game. And I could see how, the planning board and the zoning subcommittee, if the CRC is working on a zoning bylaw, you know, the planning board would know about that. And maybe the zoning subcommittee could sort of look at alternatives or things like that or help work on that. I, I don't, um, it's been a really useful committee in the past. It's really hard for seven people as a planning board to work on like subsection A1, the language and the, you know, where does the comma go? And that kind of stuff, I'm very, comfortable with because I'm an attorney and that's all it is, it seems. Um, anyway, so I, I think, you know, I could see about going on hiatus probably because we can't even meet as far as I can tell, unless we have a Zoom set up. I'd hate to lose Christine Brestrup, but I think we can either meet ourselves and maybe, or maybe get Ben Brager, who's the new member. Um, so, and then also I just think I was looking at um, 
all our committees right now have empty, empty, you know, spots and openings, and we have all these new members. And so I think maybe, you know, Maria, if you're been on this committee for three years with town new government trying to figure out how things are, how to work with them, and it's, I could see that burnout. And I, I felt that same frustration just in my six months. And so, I don't know. I just, I just think that, you know. I would hate to lose this committee that's like a really like a workhorse for the planning board on detail work. And I don't think that detracts from the CRC working on their things. And I don't think it detracts from the planning board talking about things. Um, but I do wonder about, is there a new plan for the zoning bylaw overhaul? Is Rob Mora changed the direction? You know, I listened to the CRC meeting from a few weeks ago and it sounded like the planning department was continue, planning to continue to work with the planning board. I don't know if I missed a meeting. I don't know if I'm missing some communication. So I, I would say, let's just put this all on hold till we figure out what's going on. And I, and I just think it's a very useful committee. And I also don't want to lose the planning board's role as sort of an independent advisor. And, you know, we might have some zoning bylaws we'd like to initiate. And I, but I do respect what people are saying about you don't want to just keep on working on something and have it go nowhere. Um, I would like it to go somewhere. I'd like to, I'd like the planning board and the zoning subcommittee to work closely with CRC um, on things. So that's a big bunch of things to say, but I don't, I don't think we withered away. I think we were just stopped, but I think that the zoning subcommittee has been frustrated and I'm, I'm still mentally with the plan that Rob Moore presented last March. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, oh, Andrew, finally, you, I, I don't have much to add. Um, I, I, this has actually been really helpful because I was having a hard time sort of following the bouncing ball. Um, I guess, so I've, I've like some comments and questions, so maybe you guys could just help fill me in and, you know, again, new to the board here, so there's lots for me to figure out. But is there like a, is, what's like the sense of urgent, is there a sense of urgency to do something on this now or not? Like, just not clear uh, to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe it's, it's, you know, CRC is, you know, maybe in the order of months in terms of its conception. Uh, they're figuring things out. We're figuring things out. You know, certainly the new town government puts us all in a square. But I, I do uh, uh, know that the town council is very motivated to make, you know, get some changes in the bylaw. Uh, because uh, their their terms are coming up, uh, not sure when. But uh, Chris, you can definitely fill in so many gaps here. Would you care to speak? All right. So I don't think there's a sense of urgency. I think that the CRC is going to start working on zoning. I spoke with Rob Mora the other day, and he's perfectly willing to work with CRC. <laughs> Or zoning subcommittee, whoever um, you know steps forward and says that they want to work on zoning, um, he is working on a rewrite of the whole zoning bylaw, including um, reformatting it. And our new uh, staff men member Ben Brigger has recently done a whole new numbering system for the zoning bylaw, and we're going to start to go through it chapter by chapter and figure out you know what what is difficult to understand what are conflicts, what are things that we bump our heads against when we're trying to interpret the bylaw for applicants and work through some of the technical aspects of it. And at the same time, we know that there are larger issues that people want to get a handle on, like what is a mixed use building? How, you know, what happens to the BL zoning district? Should it be the same as it is now or should it be modified somehow to allow residential used to be developed there. Um, you know, parking, we have a lot of questions about parking. Should parking be required? Um, how much of it should be required? Just on and on and on. So as my vision of this is that Rob and I will work on the reformatting and the technical aspects of it. And then as things are developed by, and I think it should be the CRC and planning staff, but as things are developed by CRC and planning staff, that they are brought into this new um, formatted zoning bylaw. And if there are things that people think 
really need attention right away and really need to be voted on right away, then maybe those things go to a, a, a go to the town council, go right to the town council, and then come back to the planning board and the CRC for a public hearing, for a recommendation, and then they're adopted. So I'm sure that there are things like that. Um, one thing I can think about right now, two things actually are, Demolition delay bylaw is being rewritten by the Historical Commission, and that is likely to be ready to be um, shown at least to town council within the next few months. Um, we also have flood maps that we're working on, and we're, we, we have to rewrite a, a text for our flood maps, and that has a time frame associated with it. So there are these substantive things that either could be plugged into the big rewrite or could be dealt with on their own. But I, I think it's, um, it's more straightforward to deal with these things with the CRC rather than having the zoning subcommittee. But I'm willing to say, let's put the zoning subcommittee in hiatus for a while until we get the ball rolling with CRC and try to figure things out. So the, that was a long answer to the question of, is there some urgency? But I also wanted to emphasize that residents and planning board members can work with the CRC. They're, they hold public meetings just like the zoning subcommittee does. So if there are members of the planning board who are very interested in working on a particular thing that the CRC is working on, they're welcome to come to those meetings. Um, and they, and I, I spoke with the CRC chair the other day and she said that she would certainly be willing to um, work with you know residents and members of the planning board who came to those meetings. So I guess that's all I have to say about it um, uh, at the moment. But um, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that it was easier to work with the CRC. Why is it easier? To, again, pardon my ignorance, but why would it be easier to work with the CRC than versus the zoning subcommittee? Um, I think the CRC is, you know, they they're five members. I think they have, um, you know, a wide array of um, interests and knowledge, and are more, you know, potentially more representative of the town, and more representative of town council thoughts and feelings about zoning. Um, and they have a direct line to town council about what town council cares about, and the zoning subcommittee attracts you know, certain individuals who are particularly interested in certain topics, but they don't really have that wide a range of um, input or interests as the CRC does. So I think it's just, it's just going to be easier to work with the CRC in that regard. Um, so th those your, are just thoughts. But your, your workload is sort of the same in either scenario. Is that, is that right? My workload would be doubled if I worked with both the CRC and the zoning subcommittee on zoning issues. Yeah, if you worked with both, but if you worked with one both. or the other. Right. So the thought is that I would work with CRC and um, try to get the ball rolling as far as zoning amendments go. Yeah, I, I believe what uh, Dave Zomack within the, the town uh, administration there has requested that as well, uh, that you attend to CRC. So that's already like a new role on your plate that you did not, did not have previously. And then we have these considerations of, of how zoning subcommittee, you know, its role before was with, you know, town meeting, uh, and then we had, you know, Maria speak at length about, um, you know, what's that mean when all these different entities are working on the same product, stepping on each other's feet. It just doesn't seem efficient. But I do, you know, certainly the planning board should be involved. We're 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 going to always have a voice and recommend. And 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 I'm wondering <clears throat> if if Chris wouldn't mind being a liaison between the planning board and the CRC within a, a allotted, you know, hardwired period of time within our regular planning board meetings, where we specifically talk about 
these zoning issues and so that we will have complete communication between CRC and the planning board uh, via Chris and then we're always welcome to attend the CRC meetings but then we can have a you know we can have discussion she can bring our discussion to them to the CRC and, and Chris can bring the CRC discussions back to the planning board and then we can have some joint meetings as well during this hiatus period is 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 my thought anyway um, again this is you know Newtown government this is all kind of figuring this out as we go um, Tom yeah sure I think Jack I was um, saying something similar to what you were saying and, and you know as an outsider so again I'm coming in just looking at this for the first time and hearing people speak about it um, I can't say they have an opinion about whether the, the subcommittee needs to exist or not, um, but it definitely seems like the process by which things are uh, brought to the table, reviewed, approved, um, discussed, and rewritten uh, has changed, and that that change has left the zoning board or the, um, the subcommittee as um, uh, almost like a moot point and as, um, you know, Maria was saying being proactive and bringing things up that chain hasn't produced any results and then waiting for those things to trickle down hasn't produced any results and I think it's just a matter of if the, uh, the zoning subcommittee is a thing it should have a really specific task and and that task should come um, you know whatever they're working on um, should be coming from either the planning board or from the planning department or from the CRC or from wherever, um, but it should be really specific in terms of what the expectations are for that group and what their objectives are. And that goes to what Janet was saying in terms of process, right? We're missing um, what the clarity of that process is. So again, I'm not for or against it. I think there are ways that we could do it as a planning board. I think there are ways that it can exist as a subcommittee, but I think it needs a very specific set of tasks and deliverables in order for it to function. So yeah, pro uh, on that note, process is something that I think we need to figure out because <clears throat> I don't know if Pam can put the the flow chart back mm -hmm. up there. Yes. Um, but I think what we're talking about is uh, on the top margin, top margin of this of this chart. It's not we're like above we're off this page and i think we need to figure out that process that that is not um here we go um but anyway th this is you know town council has has deadlines with regard to formal proposals yeah that before them and timelines and things like that but prior to all this i think we need a process to get figured out in terms of how we communicate with CRC. And again, I, I propose, you know, Chris Brestrup kind of being a liaison. Uh, we, we can have, you know, we can have people attend the CRC meetings, bring their ideas, but bring all the ideas to the planning board as a whole versus a subcommittee. Because there's just, there's just, there's, planning department has a charge to produce a, you know, a revised or amended uh, zoning bylaw by the ask from from uh, town council and CRC, and and so I would again I, I I would recommend that we we set aside time each and every planning board meeting. I assume we don't you know aren't going into the the the, the wee hours of the evening, but that we can discuss and and craft and work. You know how we want to work with the CRC uh, in terms of exchange of ideas, and we will always be uh, be able to cast you know form a, opinion and recommendations on things. But we won't be the main architects for the little fine tuning things that were done before, you know, by the zoning subcommittee. This th these are these are bigger things, bigger, heavier lifts than we are accustomed to. And that's why the planning department professionals are taking this on and have been asked by the town council to do so. 
Um, and Janet, please. So when Rob Moore came, you know, this actually, it might be helpful for people to listen to the March 4th meeting where Rob Moore made a presentation. He was talking about hiring consultants about downtown heights, setbacks, the BL, what they call transition zones between um, the general business area, which has five story heights, um, and then the neighborhoods, because the BL serves as a combination of you know, developing bu housing businesses, but also buffering the neighborhoods from um, the intensity and the heights of the, the um, BG. He also wanted consultants on the signs. And then um, we talked about inclusionary zoning, which um, has been a hot topic. And amongst the planning board back in March, we were talking, so he was saying he was be, would work with the planning board on sort of having the planning board set priorities on the issues in the zoning bylaw rewrite, like working closely with them. Um, so there's, I'm wondering if that idea of hiring consultants has disappeared or has it changed? And the other thing we were talking as a board, which got um, a lot of us really excited, was a lot of the problems with the process of going to town meeting is that town meeting heard about the, the bylaw changes. I mean, 70% of bylaw changes went in through but only heard about like our, the public process was like the warrant review. So they hadn't heard what was going on. And so we were talking about um, with Rob Mora about having kind of on the planning board website, you know, kind of these are the bylaws we're working on. This is what we're doing, look at a place for people to give input and also to have public meetings like and Rob Mora was saying we're gonna have lots of public meetings on big issues. And so that's something that the planning board could facilitate. Um, you know, to get people on board, to get the town understanding what the changes could be and soliciting their ideas. And so I'm hoping we don't lose that larger vision. Um, the CRC, I've gone to their meetings for over a year. I'm often the only person there. And so, and often it meets during the day and they're, they're not doing that kind of outreach function and things like that. So I think this is a really good discussion because I feel like we're going to like flesh out what the next steps could be. But I just, I hope that that March 4th meeting and the ideas of that and hiring consultants and in engaging the town in, in kind of larger planning isn't lost by just saying the CRC wants to take this over right now. So I'm a little confused about, you know, what, what, I, what I've heard at CRC meetings and what I'm hearing here, but Christine, are they gonna still, is Rob, are you guys still have money for consultants and we're still talking about the website or some way for the public to get access to what's going on in zoning changes in their town? Is there? Um, before Chris speaks, I, I'm, I'm wondering like CRC is not a long, has not been a long-term committee. I'm wondering if they were even in existence in March when Rob Moore, if they were, they, they hadn't really, I don't think consolidated their mission, They're like cetera, a, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Chris speak. They're like a year and a half old. CRC has changed dramatically in the last six months. Um, it had a huge mission previously and it was split up. Um, town TSO, is that it? TSO took half of CRC's responsibilities and CRC is focusing on land use issues and um, things that are related to zoning, master planning and roadway use and town, um, that type of thing. So their mission has narrowed. It's not, um, it doesn't have the great scope that it had before. And one of the reasons why is because they want to focus on zoning. Um, in terms of hiring consultants, I have $40,000 from several years ago for downtown rezoning. I have asked for another $60,000 for FY21 um, to bolster that to 100,000 to use for downtown and um, gateway and transitional area rezoning to hire a consultant. But I'm not sure that that's going to survive. We've gone through a terrific economic um, sort of a convulsion in the last four months where um, everything having to do with the economic status of the town has been um, sort of shaken. And we don't know if we're going to be able to get capital funds. That's the kind of money that I ask for when I need a consultant. I ask um, 
JCPC and town council for capital funds. And they're struggling now with operational funds. They think they have enough operational funds to get us through FY20, but they're facing um, some very difficult decisions to make in FY21. And they have um, decided to uh, only put half as much money into capital. Um, so I don't know what the status of the consultants are going to be. So a lot of it might rest on um, town staff to do the writing that we had hoped to hire consultants to do. Um, that is an un unknown right now. I don't think we can count on having um, the money that we had hoped to uh, have in the past. And I think that the planning board, ha having not having the zoning subcommittee as part of um, the zoning amendment process doesn't m diminish the role of the planning board. I think the planning board is still very important in the role of um, doing zoning amendments because the planning board is one of the groups that works with zoning amendments on a weekly or if not almost daily basis. So um, I don't feel like the role of the planning board is going to be diminished. I feel like um, they're going to have plenty of time to talk about anything that's coming before CRC, but CRC is really wanting to be the primary role for uh, working on zoning amendments and having a conduit between town council and the planning board and the residents. So that's, that's all I have to say right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, those are good uh, points, Chris. I, again, I, I feel like we can't be rewrite, rewriting things that other people are rewriting. It just makes no sense whatsoever, but we are, our mission is definitely to review and make comment and recommendations on the bylaws. Uh, and it's great that there is that component within the planning department that is dedicated now to the rewrite at the request of the town council. Mm -hmm. So it, it, but I, I think each and every planning board meeting, we need to t discuss this and we need input from you from the CRC uh, and what happens there um, or otherwise. And then we can bring in, you know, Janet has a lot of, you know, great ideas, bring that in for discussion and you provide that, you know, within that your, your role as uh, the liaison between the planning department and CRC, you bring that from us to them. But uh, that, that, those are my thoughts. Uh, Andrew? My, mine is really super fast. The, this flow chart, um, I don't, it wasn't in my PB packet. Is, um, is this, did I maybe miss an email or I just, I'm having a hard time reading it. It looks like it actually would be a really useful document for me to be able to look through. Yeah, yeah. Pam. So I would propose, you know, Pam, send this out, but I think that we need to work on the flow chart before this and and, and decide how we want to work. I mean, I'm, I just threw it. I've been suggesting some things, but we should work on how we want to communicate with town council via the CRC and, 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 and figure it out. We, we've got work to do just on the process uh, aspect of things. Mm -hmm. But Pam, will you be able to send that out to everyone? Yes, Jack, I can do that. All right. It was sent to um, us either yesterday or today, I can't remember. And so we at that time had a short list of planning board members and now we have a long list of planning board members. So it didn't get to the new members and we apologize for that. No problem. Thank and you. We, had a, we had a similar flow chart for the master plan uh, refresh mm -hmm. or update, but the master plan has officially been set aside because of bigger, more important pressing things and COVID, et cetera. But the zoning bylaws are, are still the priority uh, that's moving forward. But you might as well send, uh, you might as well <laughs> send us all that, the master plan flow chart, just, just so for informational purposes. Uh, Pam, uh, Doug? Okay, um, you know, as I've been listening to this, I've been tempted to suggest or ask whether we could get Rob Mora or somebody from CRC 
to come <clears throat> to, uh, to attend one of our meetings and we can actually talk to them rather than speculate about what's going on with them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm sure they've got a lot of other things they'd like to do, but we're spending a lot of time speculating about what they are about and um, it'd really be nice to hear from them. So mm -hmm. if it means we all need to go to the next CRC meeting and ask these questions, um, you know, Chris, maybe that's what you need to tell us. Um, I guess one other thing I'm thinking about with this flow chart is toward the bottom on the left, the planning board votes on the proposed amendment. Well, I presume that vote actually matters. And that if we oppose it, we've stopped what CRC did. No. Planning board has a recommendation role here. CRC okay. is part of town. So that's an optional board. vote. It's not optional. Recommendation. State law requires that the planning board hold a public hearing and make a recommendation to the legislative body. So the Okay. So so what happens if we recommend that it not proceed? The town council can put aside your recommendation and approve whatever it is. Um, but they have received your recommendation, which is what is required by state law. Okay. All right. Well, then, um, you know, I think a couple of times Northampton has been invoked as a, a counter example uh, where the planning department works directly with the, the uh, administration of that town and the planning board's role is predominantly just to hold the public hearing. So maybe what we really need to get through our heads is that things are changing and our role is diminished. Um, just a last thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And Janet? So under state law, the planning board can bring zoning amendments or changes to the legislative body. And that could be a town council, a city council, or um, a town meeting. And then under state law, we have to hold a hearing with the public, you know, all sorts of notice requirements and make a recommendation. Um, I feel like so those are things, those are two legal things and you know, we can't, you can't diminish those or reduce those. I don't know why we're talking about like the diminishing of the planning board um, and the role. You know, when, when Rob Moore came and talked to us, there was no talk of that. When Mandy Jo Haneke came and talked to us about this flow chart, it wasn't like we're going to try to shrink the planning board's involvement. She was talking about working with you know, closely with the, um, the CRC, you know, all the little arrows that go back and forth. Because one of the problems is like, what happens if they're working on a zoning bylaw amendment and we have some suggestions of changes and we think they're really important, we could actually start our own amendment and you wouldn't want that to happen. So the idea was to work collaboratively, collaboratively together to come up with some good things. Collaboration to the point of holding instead of two separate public meetings, having one. And so, I, you know, we could right here, right now, reduce the power and the size and the scope of the planning board and diminish. I don't know why you would. I mean, I don't know, you know, if, if we feel really strongly that mixed use buildings need to, you know, have some clarification because they kind of don't make sense or apartment buildings don't make sense because no one wants to build them because it's the mixed uses. So, like there's a lot of, there's so much expertise in the planning board in terms of working with the bylaw. If we wanna, as this group, you know, with many new members, reduce the role of the planning board just to kind of holding hearings and saying yes or no, I guess you could do that. I don't know, how did we get there? Because Rob, you know, no one has suggested that through the pandemic. I have gone to CRC meetings and you know, a lot of these discussions that are talked about, I don't see in the minutes, I don't haven't seen at the meetings I've attended or listened to. So I'm kind of just wondering, like, where are we going and why? And I think Doug's suggestion of having Rob Moore come and maybe Mandy Joe Haneke and all of us sitting down and hacking through a process. But 
you know, I've gone to these CRC meetings for a long time and they're struggling with their role and what to do. It's not like they're workshopping zoning bylaw amendments right now. And so part of me feels like, you know, when I was thinking about the zoning subcommittee, I was just thinking, let's just see what they come up with. If they have very specific zoning amendments, we'll know through Christine or I'll go. I, I mean, I think anybody should go. Um, and we'll, you know, I can, we can say, hey, this is what they're working on, bring it to the planning board. The planning board could say, hey, this is super specific. Maybe the zoning subcommittee can look at it and see how this little clause affects these six other spots. You know, when you do inclusionary zoning, you're kind of all over the bylaw. You know, that, so I don't know why we're reducing and shrinking and other than the fact that we're sort of depressed and there's COVID and there's some confusion in the town council. Why don't we just operate as a functioning planning board the way we have and just sort of stay the course? I, I'm not sure. And also, I don't know, I, you know, this, this thing kind of erupted getting rid of the zoning subcommittee in the middle of August that I'd never heard of before. So I think this is a good discussion to have, but I'm not sure why we're, how did we got here in a funny way or why, why we should be deciding today or next week or in two weeks to really kind of reduce the power and the scope or the ability of the planning board to be involved in, you know, planning and zoning in Amherst. Like where did, you know, how did we get there? Hey, well, um, before I let Chris speak, I'm just, I'm just thinking that we, um, we're, we're at the directive of the, the town council. I mean, we're, we're a board supporting, they, they tell us, sort of their elected officials, they tell us what they want from us. And I think the, and they have asked Chris to interface with the CRC now. And it just, it, I guess that's kind of symbolic of how they want the planning board to work. I, I don't know that we're diminished by any means. I feel like we're perhaps maybe even empowered because the whole board can get information from from Chris and the CRC in terms of, you know, what's going on, and and we're no, and they have dedicated staff with on, you know, the 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 within the town uh, planning department that's going at this. So I just feel like again I, I use the term stepping on each other's feet. I mean, you know, I I don't there's just no efficiency efficiency about it. And I think Maria has made that very clear. Uh, in her memo that, boy, you've, you've, you have put a lot of work in for what? Because it's not even in the, in, in the, in the pipeline of how things are working now. So, but yet we still are essential because our recommendations matter. I mean, uh, so I don't think this is a diminishing thing. I think it's, we're, we're, we're going to be speaking to we're certainly going to be speaking to bylaw changes. Uh, and if we can take a piece where Chris uh, department, you know, isn't able to address and, and we can break down and, and get, you know, maybe, you know, have the ZSC or some ad hoc committee attack it because they, they need us, then that's, that's, that's important, but I don't, um, to me, it, it's, you know, it, it seems to work. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, but um, Chris. I just wanted to say, I don't think it's a diminishment of the planning board. I think the planning board will be working side by side with the CRC on um, various things. And I think that's expressed in this flow chart that we're looking at here. Um, so the planning board still has a very strong role. I think the CRC understands that the planning board understand zoning really well because you work with it all the time and the planning department understands it really well and they're you know looking to us for advice and um, working together. So just because the zoning subcommittee may or may not exist, I don't think that diminishes the role of the planning board. And may I just say one more thing? Yes. I think that things that are important to individuals on the planning board, many of them are important to the town council and the CRC. And such things as inclusionary zoning, I think that we all recognize that 
the inclusionary zoning bylaw doesn't work. It works in some cases, but it doesn't work in other cases, and it needs more, it needs attention. And so those kinds of things are not going to get lost during this process. Those are some of the most important things that we're going to be dealing with. And we're in a different economic situation from the situation that we were in when we first started talking about inclusionary zoning, you know, 10 years ago. And now we're in a different situation. I mean, there's so much development that was happening in Amherst and will continue to happen that I don't think we're afraid of um, dampening the uh, desires of people to develop things in Amherst by tweaking our inclusionary bylaw. And I think that may be one of the things that Janet is very, well, I know Janet is very passionate about inclusionary zoning. And that may be one of the things that she's worried will fall by the wayside, but I don't think it will. I think that everybody recognizes that that's a big issue that we have to deal with. So I just wanted to offer that as a uh, kind of a bomb in Gilead, if you will, <laughs> to this discussion. Uh, Maria, please. Um, I just want to say, I, I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer. I, I was just trying to give some history about, you know, how the DSC has tried to be proactive and how the town council really is just trying to get their feet under them. And so I am excited that once they come up with a directive for us, that we can dive deep into it, whether it's with the planning board or zoning subcommittee or the MPIC that we've talked about, this um, committee master plan implementation committee. There's so many exciting things that could come our way. And so I don't mean to say like, I'm trying to, you know, dissolve work or whatever. I'm just saying, let's not throw another cook in the kitchen right now because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, that's a lot of analogies, but <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm just saying, for now, let's lighten the load on the planning staff. Let's hear from CRC what they want us to maybe, you know, study. And hopefully there are things we're interested in too. And um, <clears throat> I think, I don't know if the newest members saw the top three lists that we, uh, as a planning board discussed, it was like um, downtown, mm, downtown something. I don't know exactly. I mean, downtown is pretty broad, but it's not like, um, there are different aspects of downtown, but I think we kept it really broad. We didn't yeah. specify. Another was um, housing. My, that's my 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 thing. Um, I'm carrying the torch for that. Is uh, to unlock parcels and diversify our housing stock. And then the third one was was it inclusionary zoning. No, what was it? It was recodification. But I think inclusionary yeah. zoning is included in downtown um, revitalization and. Uh, anything having to do with housing. Yeah, so it was pretty big, broad topics, but we sent to CRC like our top sort of initiatives and priorities, and then hopefully, I don't know when, but they'll come back to us with something that maybe they either discuss with us or task for us to study, or I don't know what, but for now, yeah, I just want to um, pump the brakes on, you know, creating more work and more random studies until we know where we're going. So I just want to say, yeah, I'm not trying to say, like, let's do less. I'm just saying, let's wait to hear what it is that we should be doing. Yeah, so I, you know, I feel like we should continue bringing, you know, ideas directly to the planning board, not in a committee setting, but bringing it in and then having Chris you know, deliver that to the CRC, bring in information from the CRC. But I, I think we have a lot, you know, of good ideas um, that need to be heard that we can all discuss. Uh, but I do feel like we need, we kind of need a flow chart that's a precursor to, to the one that's on their screen right now. Uh, Janet? So we actually have an extra meeting at the end of this month. And I wonder like if we could sort of devote, you know, if we don't have, I'm hoping that we don't have a lot of permits and things like that, but I wonder if we could devote that time to talking about, you know, the master plan implementation committee, if we want to start that up or committee assignments, because we have a lot of stuff. So maybe, you know, we have a lot of new members. And so maybe we can talk about what each committee does um, and how those things fit together. Um, I would encourage people to read the minutes of the CRC and things like that. Because right now they're working on housing policy. I'm not sure what they're doing specifically. I don't think they're working on any specific zoning things. And so um, 
but maybe you know people could read up a little bit um, on that and and things like that. So maybe in our last extra meeting of the month, we could talk about you know who's doing what or who wants to be on what committee. And if we if we do the master plan implementation committee, people should look at you know chapter ten of the master plan or the new maybe the new members can do the heavy lift and read the master plan because there's a lot to that too. So I don't want to like throw all these things out, but I do think it's like a time for sort of reorganizing and re remembering and things like that. So that's, that's just my suggestion. Yeah, I do believe that, you know, master plan discussions and the zoning bylaw can be, you know, part of our regular agenda item. And, you know, the, the agenda can kind of be decided before we meet, but certainly allotting you know, time to talk about either one of those. Although the zoning zoning bylaws is going to be the more important thing, but again, I think it all starts with coming out of the, you know, from Rob Mora, the building commissioner, and and the planning department in terms of you know their their draft, and then we can start commenting, and that'll get the discussion started. But we do need work, I think, with that flow chart. Um, but um, I, just going back to something that Janet had said before was like, before the planning board was the gatekeeper sort of for zoning amendments to town meeting. And then you had the petition articles, right? And 10 voters, I don't know if that's correct, but it sounds, sounds good. But now we are still one of those entities and the public petitions uh, are still there. But in addition, now we have the CRC and we have individual town council members, I believe, that can initiate, you know, zoning amendments. So there's, there's a lot, well, there's a lot of moving parts here and we're just not the pipeline that we used to be with the former uh, town government. Chris? I just wanted to mention that Rob Mara and I are planning to meet with the CRC on September 15th, which is in the afternoon. So some of you may not be able to come, but if you are able to, you might want to um, tune in on that meeting. So we're going to be talking about what we're doing with the zoning bylaw. So that's September 15th. I think it's at two o'clock in the afternoon. But now to my calendar. Okay. What what time is that, Chris? I believe it's at two. I think that's when they generally meet, but I can confirm that for you. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's it's eight fifty three. If we were talking about nine nine o'clock, we're awfully close to that point. Um, I think we've had a lot of productive conversations on on zoning and 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 what our role may or may not be, um, and we'll, we'll continue this discussion, you know, in the next meetings. Uh, so, is everyone generally okay with moving on from from this topic, so we can wind up? Okay. I see some heads shaking uh, affirmatively. Uh, so topics not reasonably anticipated 40 hour, 48 hours prior to the meeting. I don't have anything. Okay, and then new business. Do you have anything there? I don't have anything there. All right, and then form A and R subdivision applications. Um, I would like to ask Pam um, if she remembers if we have any new ANRs. I have this feeling that we have a new ANR that's gone to Jason, but I can't remember. Do we have a new ANR, Pam? That is ready for tonight? No. no we have something that's going to come up on September 16th. And can you um, what that is? No, I don't. Because actually it hasn't gone to Jason. It's going to go to Jason on Friday okay. when I'm in the office on well, Friday. We have a new A&R, but not for tonight, for the 16th of September. 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, upcoming ZBA applications? Um, Chris, I'm behind the loop in that because I haven't been to the staff meeting. So I'm, I'm not aware of anything new. Not aware of anything new either. Okay. And then upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. We do have one application, which I may have already told you about, which is the library wants to put a tent on their front lawn to um, conduct library business. And that'll be coming to you on the 16th. Okay. And uh, if we get down to the planning board committee and liaison reports, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I did attend executive committee meeting last Thursday. Um, we approved lots of money for them to spend <laughs> from various sources. But I, I have to admit, Chris, uh, there was this community uh, development block grant uh, discussion that, meant, you know, they, they, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is a great uh, uh, entity for getting money into Western Mass. And I think, you know, through the CARES Act. But they pretty much like went all around Amherst for one particular grant. And I, so I assume that Amherst was doing its own thing in terms of pursuing our own own loan uh, as part of the, uh, of the CARES Act. And I just wondered if you were aware of that and, and maybe get me in the, in the loop a little bit more because I was just like, why not Amherst sort of thing? <laughs> we have there. applied for money from the CARES Act and um, we've received I think it's three hundred and twenty-one thousand um, uh -huh. dollars for various uses, and I believe that one of them is um, a micro helping micro businesses, um, and some of the money is going to Craig's Doors. And I'm sorry that my brain is not really full right now with the other items, but I can send you a memo that lists um, how that money is broken down and to whom it's going. Uh, so I would do and, that. And I understand a, a lot of the towns within our region don't have as strong as planning department as we have in Amherst. Yes. And, 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 and so we, we do, we tend to, you know, sometimes do our own thing because we have that, that yes. capability and that, and that, and that avenue uh, to the, directly to the, to the funding agencies. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make that comment and, uh, but that's all with, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I guess. And then once we get settled, you know, we get an associate uh, commissioner or I don't know what that would be. An alternative. But so that's alternative. something we can discuss on um, when you talk yeah, about. When Joanna comes on board and, and again, we have a few spots to fill. So, yeah. Um, would, you like, would you like a regular report on grants that we're going after or grants that we've received because that's one of the big things that we do and we've been going after a lot of them recently well just for my participation on the pioneer valley commission it might because i just feel like i don't know what's going on yeah when i discuss those things but i will uh, do that And so, Mike, uh, you know, we thank his, you know, service, and and we're gonna miss him. Uh, but he he was our um, liaison for the Community Preservation Act committee. And um, I don't know if they've met, but again, if next cycle we get Johanna here and we'll start nominating uh, some people and get you know all of us involved the extent that people are interested in in, 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 in these things. The Agricultural, Agricultural Commission, again, has been vacant. And then the Design Review Board, um, same thing. Um, but I don't know if you can speak to the CPAC or the Design, design uh, Review Board. Do you know anything, Chris? Um, yeah, I know that CPAC is starting its work earlier this year. Um, Sonia Aldrich, who's the um, comptroller, is their staff person, and she's starting their process in mid-October. Um, she's asking to have 
uh, applications received by then. So um, we're working in the planning department trying to figure out if we're going to apply for anything. But the categories are um, housing, affordable housing, recreation, open space, and Historic. historical commission. Yeah. Yes. So, um, oh, so we've been thinking about this, and I'm sure that members of the community have been thinking about this. So if there are things that you're interested in applying for, you, um, you might want to just let me know so I can put it into the pipeline. Um, but that is coming up on October 12th. So they're going to be starting to meet once they get their applications in from all the various um, service organizations and um, entities that apply for these funds. Um, they are going to have to go through them and then uh, decide what they're going to recommend to town council for funding. Usually they don't start that process till like November, December, January. Thank you, Chris. And the design review board, nothing you're design aware of. It is going to be meeting soon. I think sometime in the next two weeks. And one of the topics they're going to be reviewing is um, the wayfinding signs. We have designs for the wayfinding signs, but we need oh, no. to secure locations for them. So um, that's one of the things that's going to be talked about. And I know what the other thing is, but it's not coming to mind right now. So yeah. So I, I know that those that the signage was a big deal for the, um, you know, uh, aging uh, mm -hmm. committee come up with with in terms of making the town more accessible, mm -hmm. and that that that'll be good to get some progress on that. Uh, the zoning subcommittee we've already discussed. Um, report of the chair. I wanted to thank. Jack. Hey Jack. Oh, yes. Um, sorry no. to interrupt, but I had my hand up and I wanted to oh, say I'm sorry I didn't say it. Yeah. before you moved on to the next thing. Um, since we have these new members and we're gonna have to do new assignments for our liaison to these other committees, I was wondering if Chris or Pam could just put together a list of these committees and when they meet so that as we're thinking about whether to, we'd be interested in joining them, we can take into consideration our schedules. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. That mm -hmm. would probably help the conversation when we actually get to it. Good idea. Thank you. I don't know if you have it on your list, Jess. Sorry to interrupt, but you know. Also, since since we are are some new members, I, I I'd love to sort of introduce myself formally if we get to a point um, in the agenda. I'm going to do that, that, Andrew. I, I was figured you were. That. I, That's I'll my back off. Thing. I'll back off. <laughs> and and Andrew, please <laughs> tell tell us a little bit about you. Oh, <laughs> caught me off guard. Um, uh, well, just I wanted to 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 uh, say hello and that I'm very excited and, and happy to be part of the committee here. Um, I am a longtime Amherst resident. I actually have done kind of two tours of duty here. I did K through, through bachelors, lived in North Carolina for a long time, and then I came back and have been here for about 12 years. Um, my background, I actually have a degree in landscape architecture. I've studied some regional planning, uh, but I've been in the private sector in banking for the last 20 years um, and, and my roles have been to help determine the optimal geographic distribution of our branches and ATMs. So largely it's a planning slash real estate function. Um, and so I hope that um, that experience maybe can, can bring some new opinions or ideas to the board. I, I'm looking forward to, to getting to meet all of you and sort of learning more about um, you know what you what you do and and your interests, but uh, I, I'm super excited to be here and wish it wasn't uh, via Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, I I appreciate that. Tom, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background and and, and interests? Sure. Um, so uh, I am a, a resident of Amherst. I have two children uh, going to public schools, um, one in elementary, one in middle school, so at Fort River. Um, 
My wife is a UMass alum, native of the area. So we came back here from New York City and from Boston. Um, I had a seven years, uh, seven and a half years of architectural training. So um, my master's degree is in um, advanced architectural design from Columbia. So I've been studying architecture for quite some time and working on um, a variety of, of kinds of projects from um, high-end residential to working at larger firms, working on public process for, um, I was at a firm called um, CBT in Boston and, and worked with them um, on some sort of air rights projects and all kinds of different things. Um, and over the years, I sort of evolved into um, a ver sort of a designer of many different things. And so my work is uh, in large in scope. And I actually own a branding agency here uh, in the area. And I do branding design and marketing and promotion for companies like Bueno Isano and um, Tea Guys and other uh, bars ice cream, <laughs> different organizations in the area, done complete rebrands and stuff like that for them. Um, while working as a, uh, a partner or collaborator with uh, an architecture um, group out of Boston and uh, we do a memorial projects. So we enter um, public memorial projects probably every once a year. We'll submit something. We're finalists for the um, Martin Luther King Memorial and the Boston Commons. So I was on that team. We were one of five finalists for that. Um, so we've been working, we finished um, a memorial for the abolition of slavery in non-France, which is um, like a 5 million euro project um, right on the waterfront there. So we, you know, I, I've been involved in a, a wide array of projects and I'm just really, uh, my research and I'm, oh, I'm a professor, I teach architecture um, at uh, Hampshire College now, I was joint appointed at Amherst College and Mount Holyoke College for the first 10 years of my, um, um, my tenure here. Um, but I teach architectural design and um, uh, graphic design as well. Um, and my research is focused on human-centric uh, design and the human experience in relationship to form and, um, and style. <laughs> so, nice. so I'm just excited to be here and um, uh, see what I can contribute, um, you know, whether that's from a design aesthetic uh, point of view or from a community ecosystem point of view, um, I'm excited to play a role. Thank you, Tom. Are, are you licensed? Uh, I'm not licensed, no. I don't, would, would there be a license? That I don't, I don't, I, I'm like, I, I know architects have to do so much. It's like, I, it's I not a four-year, minimally, it's not a four-year thing. You, you gotta go five. Or, well. Actually, I did a five-year undergrad um, and yeah. went straight to graduate school because I knew I did not want to do a um, um, seven years of internships or whatever it was that I, you know, CAD monkeying. So yeah. I, I moved into uh, teaching right out of graduate school. So that was my focus was to um, nice. get into academia right away. I, I have a driver's license, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, licenses. Um, I'm wondering if we should wait for Johanna or should we give a little spiel, myself and, and Doug and, and Maria uh, and Janet, or wait, uh, whatever you guys, we, we can just end the meeting now. What's, what's, your, what's your fancy there? It might be helpful for, for her to hear your yeah. introduction as well. Cause that, okay. That you want to redo it because I think it'll be really helpful for us. Okay. But, but I think it's going to be helpful for her as well. So to put um, backgrounds to faces, I think. And, and she's already heard from, from Tom and I through the, uh, the interview process. So. Okay. So, yeah. so show, you know, do we want to speak now or just kind of wait? We still wait. I would say wait. We'll wait. Okay. All right. Um, report of staff. You're muted. We can't hear you. I was saying something nice. I said, I'm so happy to have new members. It's really exciting to work with you and get to know you, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you for um, signing up, and we're we're just happy to have you. Very happy. <laughs> Welcome. Cool. 
Yeah. Uh, and then it's adjournment. And adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and and our next meeting is September sixteenth. Sixteenth. Okay. Yeah. Make sure that's okay. in there. And I'm trying to get some um, decisions done. Thank you all for coming out and signing the decisions. Jenna came out in the rain today, so she's really dedicated. Um, but I'm planning to crank through some more decisions because we're a little bit backlogged. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even know it was raining very much today because I'm in my basement and oh, uh, the windows. The windowless basement. Come on, Dick. <laughs> And That's Maria, you know, you got to help me out here. Blast the, <laughs> blast the window here somewhere. But. We need some egress windows in there for at least ventilation. Come on. All right. Okay. Well, we'll see okay. You Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.